Hello. Um, well, welcome to my session. Uh, obviously, please, uh, please rate the session in the talk. So this session is called The Five Pillars of Collaborative Product Ownership. Um, my name is John LeDrew, and I have been working in the software industry for about 20 years. And during that time, I've done a whole bunch of different things, including a software engineer, team lead, technical lead, architect, development manager, tester, BA, project manager, God forbid, and even a product owner. I, I found that the, uh, this role um, was probably one of the hardest to do. Um, now working as a coach, I find myself spending more time focusing on supporting project management and product ownership than any other part of the role. Um, so before I begin completely, I'd like to invite anyone in a project management, project ownership role to stand up, please. And I'm going to give you a little present. You are going to get a present. So, uh, so that's the incentive to stand up if you're sure. Right. There we go. See, look, look, once you knew you were going to get a present, there you go. Sorry for leaning over you. There you go. And there's another one here. There should be some other people. For people that stood a bit further back, there'll be some other people uh, coming. I know there's a person hiding over there who wants one. <laughs> so I, know, I know you're a BA <laughs> or a product manager. Um, so if you haven't got one yet, please do. You will stay, stay stood up, stay stood up. There are people coming to give you, give you stickers. You can't be without them. Oh, God, you can't do that, that as well once you get a bit older. Um, all right. So those of you that have got those stickers and those of you that are still awaiting the joy of those stickers um, will, will notice that they have some interesting things on them. Uh, so some phrases that people might have heard before. Who, who's heard the phrase, the single ringable neck before? Anyone? You heard that before? I'm amazed that less people, uh, less people haven't heard it. Um, does anyone know where that phrase comes from? Just shout out and I'll, I'll repeat if I, hopefully I can hear you. Anyone knows where that comes from? It originates from at all? So uh, who's heard of a guy called, or a book called, How to Do Twice as Much, much Work in Half the Time? Uh, famous scrum book. So, yes, the phrase came originally, uh, it was originally coined in that book, and that was pretty much the book that launched Scrum. I'm just going to leave that there, because I find it a really interesting point that that's where that phrase originates from. Why do we think that phrase exists? Other phrases like the single point of accountability, the one throat to choke, does anyone have any ideas? Why do, we, why do we have those ideas? What's the point of a, a single product owner? Anyone want to shout? You can shout out, and I'll do a repeat back. Someone to blame. That's a good one. Do, do we think that... Raise your hands up if you think having someone to blame helps the successful delivery of a software project. Uh, <laughs> I saw one hand hiding over there. Could I, ask, could I possibly ask why? So, if I heard you correctly, managing all of the stakeholders, so talking to all of them and helping the stakeholders feel more relaxed, that there's one person. So, what, because all the stakeholders have someone they can kind of, I don't know, uh, beat to death. That will make them feel better. Like They're kind of like a human stress ball for the stakeholders. Um, I, I, I'm not sure. I can see how that might make the stakeholders feel better if they're of a certain mindset, but I, can, I can't necessarily see how that leads to the successful delivery of the project. Um, so there's an interesting question. Do we think we need a single point of accountability in order to deliver a project successfully? Is it essential? Maybe. Because I don't know necessarily the answer to that question, but almost every project that I have been involved with in some way or another has probably had someone who's considered to be the single point of accountability, whether they were called a product owner or given some other name. So uh, hopefully this will work. I'm going to ask you the question, what makes a great product owner? In a second, I'm going to show the next slide and we'll see if technology works. It is so far. So basically, if you can open your phones and go to 
that URL, you'll be invited to enter a single word. Um, what I'd like you to do is to drop in a word which to you represents a trait of a great product owner. Okay, so something that a great product owner might be able to do or to demonstrate or to behave like. And uh, with any luck, it will appear on this screen. Uh, but conference Wi-Fi can be entertaining at points like this. <laughs> Let's see if anything comes up. Has anyone done it? Oh, experienced. That's pretty good. Vision. Red, apparently. That's a good one. Uh, <laughs> collaborative. Trousers. I appreciate trousers. Wow, this is going quickly. Knowledge. Let's say, okay, a few are coming out here. Knowledgeable. That's an interesting, uh, an interesting leader trait there. Uh, quite like to see. Swag. I like that. Yeah. Still red. There's a the general uh, preference. Uh, Okay, so I'll let you uh, continue with that. The, uh, I'm amazed by the general lack of expletives, actually. Um, so, oh, slow, that's an interesting one. Um, so, so, with the, uh, I, might have, I think I might have uh, goaded swag. This is uh, <laughs> slightly there. Um, so, uh, yeah, I like, I think, yeah, what makes a great product owner? Vision, swag. Um, what I find interesting here is, if you look at that list, and obviously the ones on that list that perhaps have, uh, have a root in, uh, in reality, um, is that do we actually believe that we have product owners and that, that really embody all of those things? Oh, I love it. So I was, when, they, when they said, do you want to enable emojis, uh, emoji support, I wasn't sure if it would work, but there we go. <laughs> Uh, so apparently I have someone who could be a, either a croissant or a giraffe, I noticed in there as well. So what's... Uh, <laughs> we're going to have to take this slide off in a second. The, uh, so the ones that are there, there's a few interesting ones that have come up actually, um, that admittedly are falling and getting smaller and smaller as the, uh, as the time goes on, um, is that what we have there are things like um, vision, things like communicator, things like collaborator even. Um, but one that actually was big very early on was the word knowledge, which I find really interesting. Because should a product owner have all the knowledge? Should they know all of the things? Should they know about everything? Or maybe should that be shared with the team? Maybe the whole team is going to know and learn about the product. So all of those things that we saw, perhaps leaving out giraffe and, <laughs> and uh, croissant uh, and other vegetables, um, is that is, do you, who actually has worked with a product owner or thinks they're a product owner that embodies many of those useful traits out of interest? Good product owners. Could I ask now, just, just to, as a, an actual captain, who's currently working on a project, or has at least very recently worked on a project with a product owner on it, or someone in a role similar? So quite a bit less than, quite a bit less than half. This was actually a lot better than normal, I point out, from a, a ratio of people that are working with product owners that they actually think fit all of those things. So this is the definition for product owner, technically, it's from the Scrum Guide. Um, this is actually deliberately taken from the Agile Alliance, mainly because I wanted something that wasn't specific, as a product owner isn't really specific to Scrum any longer. Um, but it's largely word for word similar to what was there. So this is the definition. The product owner is a role on a product development team responsible for managing the product backlog in order to achieve the desired outcome that a product development team seeks to accomplish. See, I kind of like that definition. I like that definition because we have a product owner who's a role on the product development team. They don't own the product development team. 
and they're managing the product backlog in order to achieve the desired outcome that the product development team seeks to accomplish. Which means that collectively, this team, along with the product owner as member of that team, have collaborated in defining that goal and the best way to reach it. That sounds pretty good. Now, unfortunately, this definition kind of goes downhill. It has a whole set of separate bullet points which go on uh, to cause concerns for me. So the next bullet point immediately underneath says, clearly identify and describe the product backlog items in order to build a shared understanding of the problem and the solution with the product development team. Well, I have a lot of issues with this because according to this definition, we have the product owner identifying the problems, um, defining the problems, uh, solving the problems, and then presenting the problems and the solutions to the product development team, who I imagine then go to the pub. Um, which, uh, which, I mean, would be, I guess, a pretty decent job, um, but maybe not as fulfilling as, as maybe they would like. The, the other problem I have here with this definition is, is with this word, this word solution. Solution is a, is a, a challenging word for me because, because the one thing you don't have at the time you have a backlog is a solution for anything. What you have is a hypothesis. You have an idea that this thing that you might want to do might fulfill the needs of your users. What you don't have is a solution. You have a solution when the needs of the users have been solved. And I imagine that if you've just ordered the latest iPhone uh, and the box arrives and you open it up and inside there is uh, an index card or a small stack of index cards wonderfully describing all of the features that you could receive that you potentially wouldn't feel that your needs uh, as a... I don't really know what needs that thing's uh, for, for solving. Um, your needs are going to be uh, so solved at that point. So, next bit. Make decisions regarding the priority of backlog items in order to deliver the maximum outcome with minimum output. Um, when I first read that, I, I used to find these, these two quite funny. Um, they're actually taken from Jeff Patton's... Uh, Jeff Patton coined this idea. Maximum outcome meaning the, the value delivered and minimum output meaning the energy output from people or the money invested. But I find it... Uh, I still found it a fairly confusing way of describing that. Um, the problem I have with this is how does the product owner make decisions? Anyone want to tell me? Who's a product owner at the moment? I can see some of you with, the, <laughs> with your labels. Um, who, how do you make a decision on the product backlog item? Anyone want to tell me? Just shout. Pardon? Talking with your team. Well, that sounds amazing. <laughs> Genius idea. How does the... Uh, any, any other ideas? Go for it. So determining which customer brings the most value to the company. Um, there is one really important word in that sentence, which is the word customer. <laughs> um, and value, actually, but customer specifically is interesting to me. Um, in going back to the team point, and in fact this one, so you've got this pile of backlog items, or maybe even an empty backlog, and you need to decide what to do. So what do we then do? So we might talk to the team, but how does the team know? Or how, does the, um, how do you talk to your customers if you talk to your customers? How do you make those evaluations? Like, what's the next step? Do we ask the customer? Does anyone ask the customer what they want? Maybe. Who's heard of the phrase user experience? I hope most have these days. OK, so who would leave your hands in the air if you've heard of user experience, because I know the answer from the others. Uh, I love how more hands went up that time. Um, so put your hand down, OK, if uh, you currently don't use user experience to, uh, to make all of the decisions for your product direction. OK. So essentially, we have, I mean, I don't know how many people are in this room, but a significantly small mi minority of people actually use user experience, which is data-driven research 
into what their customer needs, validated, validating hypothesis to decide on the directions that you're going to take. Okay? I know there are other things that might come in, but many organizations these days are driving that decision-making process with user experience. So let's look at the last one. Determine whether a product backlog item was satisfactorily, satisfactorily delivered. How do we decide if something has been delivered? Any ideas? How do we know it's been satisfactorily delivered? Just shout out, because I won't be able to see your hands. We have, we have feedback, feedback from customers. Yep, feedback from customers. That's a really good one. Has this actually solved your problem? Which is an interesting point, which means that for something to be, to get feedback from customers on that point, before you know whether it's been delivered, it has to be in production in front of your users in some degree, really. Not necessarily, but often it has to be. Any other ideas? How else do people do it? Those that aren't asking their customers. A-B testing? So that's kind of the same, because you are putting it into production if you're A-B te I mean, assuming you're A-B testing with your actual customers. <laughs> Any other ways? You've got something done, features delivered. How does the, the product owner, in this case, make that decision? Done or not? We kind of got right to the, the best answer there. So often what happens is the product owner says, yeah, that's all right. That looks fine. I'll show it to my boss. My boss said it looks great. Let's get it in production now. And it's done. Checkbox. You've, you've increased your velocity for that week. Throughput's gone up. A chart looks good. And then we have this one. Ensure transparency into the upcoming work of the product development team. I find this one most interestingly contradictory because I find it really strange. To me, um, it, it, the very initial description actually said that the whole team worked together on defining the product direction. Um, and yet, apparently, once you've decided on those goals and the backlog, the product owner then hides away most of the things and only ensures transparency to the bits that they would like. Um, I find this kind of interesting. Who's, who's worked with a team or uh, as a product owner or on a team where the Product owner kind of hides a lot of the backlog from the team for some reason, doesn't show it, brings down like every planning meeting, there's one over there, brings down. Um, now, I've, I've asked product owners that have done that before, and they'll say things like, they'll say things like, well, you know, if we showed them the whole backlog, I mean, they might just start developing stuff. I've never noticed that happen before. I've never ever seen a team like genuinely go, oh, what do we have to do? Obviously, we have absolutely nothing to do this week, or rather, the stuff we're on now is a bit crappy and boring. We'll just start working on the stuff that's barely planned, completely misunderstood. We don't have any answers yet that we're going to do for next year. Um, I've never seen that before, uh, but it's an interesting, an interesting uh, paranoia that some product owners seem to have. So, oh, we kind of covered that already. Let's go on to the next one. So, we kind of know that uh, I think a lot of the time, if we're not actually asking our customers what they want and we're not validating with our customers that what we've delivered is actually solving their problems, then how good do we think we are? about really delivering what our customers need. So uh, just as a show of hands, what percentage, who thinks that more than 50% of the features that they deliver to their customers are in active use right now? And I, I trust the people that put their hands up with user experience on that <laughs> earlier. Um, who thinks less than 50%? Less than 10%? Wow, that, that must be quite depressing <laughs> a little bit. Uh, so this is uh, some data that's taken from a report called Exceeding Value from the Standish Group. They also produce a report called the Chaos Study that some people might have heard of. Um, there's a lot of 
uh, there's always controversy around the chaos study reports, especially on these kinds of things, because of the fact that it's incredibly hard to really test this stuff. Um, this particular one was done with, I think, uh, just over a thousand um, organizations, uh, blue chip organizations across the states, and these were looking at internal systems, so like CRM systems, order processing systems, developed as bespoke applications. And what they were doing was a comparison between what the engineers uh, knew they had delivered features the engineering teams and the companies knew they had delivered versus the features that the actual people using the product, let's say in the accounts team using an order processing system, um, actually knew about. <laughs> you know, did they even know that that feature was there? What did they actually use? Um, even if you apply a very big error margin to this data, stating that you know, anything between, let's say, 50 and 80 to 90% of features are hardly ever used. I think it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty poor testament <laughs> on our ability to know what our customers want, or specifically our ability to know what they want when we don't ask them. <laughs> so the most important thing is a thing that I'm going to tell you afterwards. Um, so. Does anyone know who this is? Anyone heard of this guy? His name is Frederick Winslow Taylor. Um, he is a, uh, an early 20th century humanitarian. Uh, so this is a, a quote. The ordinary pig iron handler is the type of man, not the type of man well suited for shoveling. He's too stupid. There is too much mental strain and too much knack required of a shoveler. All right, so look, he wasn't a humanitarian. Um, but he was a scientist. So Frederick Winslow Taylor is often uh, pilloried for his contribution to specifically his invention of scientific management um, and all of the challenges that that has put into place. And uh, they're fairly rightly put, <laughs> uh, put at his feet. Um, but the one thing that he did do was that certainly from my research, he was one of the first people in industry to actually make decisions on strategy and process based on empirical data. So let's look at what he was doing. So Taylor worked uh, in a factory, a metalworking factory. Now, anyone that's worked or has ever seen a factory before knows that you have a bunch of stations that essentially do specific tasks. So in the case of his one, you have people shoveling pig iron, and you have people, uh, they're shoveling out into a furnace, that's melting down the metal, then they're metal workers, etc. And in this case, he, what he wanted to do was improve the efficiency of these factories. So he breaks down all of those tasks into their separate components, so each of those steps. And then he measures each one to work out how long they're taking. So you end up measuring Bob, who's shoveling the pig iron into the thing over here, and he measures each step. And then he goes through, and he actually, because obviously there's not just one person, there's actually, you know, let's say 10 people all shoveling pig iron. And he then measures each one and looks at the data. And to his absolute horror, there was a massive, massive divergence between each of these individuals. You've got Bob, who's kind of shoveling with the shovel that his mum gave him for Christmas, and you've got Bobby here, who kind of does this double-handed speed shovel throw thing, and this other guy is massive, and he kind of like grabs them in his arms. And amazingly, or unamazingly, they all took a different amount of time to do this task. And Taylor was like, well, there's got to be one true way to do this. There can't just be a whole load of different things. This is a simple task. This is mad. So he said, look, I want to do an experiment. I think that it would, you'd all be quicker. It seems that Bob's mum's shovel is quicker than, than Steve's process. So could you all do it that way? I'll get you all the same shovel. And they went, no. I'm a craftsperson. This is the way I've done it my entire life. My granddad taught me to do this. My father taught me to do this. And so he said, you're fired, and he found new people. And eventually, after some uh, cycle of individuals, he then found people willing to take part in his experiment. Um, and over time, he was able to demonstrate that, uh, that he was able to demonstrate a significant improvement into the efficiency of, of those plants by that method. So what did he do? He formed a hypothesis. I think Bob's on the shovel's better than the other ways. Let's do an experiment. Maybe a number of people had to be fired in order for that experiment to take place. 
And from that, he was able to get some learning. He learned. Now, did he always learn in the positive? No. He didn't always learn that his ideas worked. In that case, in fact, when it comes to shovels, uh, anyone who's had the pleasure, pain of reading any of the work on scientific management will know there is a significant number of pages dedicated to the detailed descriptions of shovel sizes and exactly how many pounds the optimal shovel will carry. Um, he learned a huge amount, I can tell you. <laughs> um, but what's interesting is, is that many, many times, uh, anyone that's worked in science will know that, that your uh, hypotheses are frequently disproven. In fact, you're actively trying to disprove your hypotheses when you're working. So from that learning comes further hypotheses that feeds into a continuous cycle, a cycle of continuous learning. Now, we've heard the phrase continuous learning before when we talk when kind of modern management nomenclature. And the interesting thing is, is that he did have an environment of continuous learning. The challenge and what he was, uh, the challenge that he had is that it was limited entirely to the upper echelons of the organization. The only view, and to, to quote him, the only view uh, that, that he had that, that had the mental capacity for that kind of planning work. <laughs> so, but like I said, he did dramatically increase the efficiency of his factories. So, what was he missing? So around the same time that Aretha Franklin was singing this, uh, a number of decades in the future, on the other side of the Pacific, there was this guy. Can anyone tell me the name of this guy? Anyone? So this guy is Taichi Ono. Um, along, with, uh, along with Eiji Toyoda, he created the Toyota production system. And this is his quote. People don't go to Toyota to work. They go there to think. I think you can probably ascertain from that that he had a slightly different view of his workers to, uh, to Taylor. The Toyota production system was developed uh, between 1948 and 1975, and it's essentially that, that essentially turned into what was lean manufacturing in the US, uh, and essentially lean manufacturing strongly influenced um, the kind of the agile software movement and lean software movement. So what they actually do is they package this up. Uh, recently, in 2001, they packaged, tried to package it up with their kind of uh, Toyota production system and other things into a thing they call the Toyota Way. Um, this is their kind of management philosophy, really. Um, and there's a short video that I think we tested this before, so hopefully this will work. It's only a couple of minutes. It's quite overwhelming when you walk through the first time. You've got things flying everywhere, boxes and trucks. When you walk through the door and you actually see how big the place is. After you've been here and you realise how everything operates, you can understand why everything's in a certain place, everything has to be in a certain place. My name's Pete Dennis. I started here in May the 11th, 1992. I left mining and I applied for the position of team member in the press shop. I got took on as a team leader when we first started here in, in 92. And I can remember walking into the press shop, bearing in mind the presses I'd worked on were probably maximum up to 50 tonne. We walked into there and they're 3,000 ton presses and they're about as big as a block of flats. So that was a little bit daunting for me. The Toyota production system is the foundation of what Toyota do. Every single member here has the right to stop the line. If he sees something that's not quite right, we have what we call the hand-on system. He has the right to stop that line. Everybody's involved in it. It's not just top-down. We encourage, as we call it, bottom-up. So if a team member comes to me and says, I have an idea for this, you don't ignore him. Because nobody has a better idea than that member. And the biggest asset we've got is, is the guys that work here. And it's not because you, know, you, you cut them open and they lock sticker on and they've got Toyota to do it. That's not it. It's just the amount of faith and pride that the people have got. 
and they will do what they can to help this company because they know it's helping them at the end of the day. All right, turns into a bit of a recruitment video after that. So that's a really interesting video. There's a few key, uh, key things that I'd like to pull out from that. Um, one of the things he says there is if a, a member, well, firstly, the use of the word member. <laughs> He, they describe all employees as members uh, as opposed to employees or subordinates, uh, which uh, is an interesting, an interesting thing to highlight. The other side is that he says, if a member comes to me with an idea, then you listen, because who better knows to change the way that they're working or to improve things than that, that individual? Um, that's a key thing. So for them, the idea that the people on the floor, the people at the station, are the core source, the, the experts in what they do, is absolutely foundational. So who... Um, the, yeah, that's right. So one of their, their key things, so the Toyota Way is built into two pillars and uh, I think 14 principles. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them because we don't have time and I want to really focus on how I see this can apply to our approach as product organisations. But I really do recommend it. It's all completely available online and searching for uh, the Toyota Way will give you huge amounts of information um, and it's, it's really interesting. So one of the pillars is this idea saying that they, you need to become a learning organisation. And a core part of that is, is this idea they have, which has been their suggestion box system. So it's an interesting thing. Who has a suggestion box system in their organization at the moment? Not that many do, actually. Who, uh, very few, actually. Who has actually made a suggestion in their suggestion box? OK. Uh, I, I, it's a really small number, so I'm trying to see. And out of those people, who has had a suggestion implemented? Okay. Oh, so, of the four people that put their hands up, I think all of them had their suggestion implemented, which is great. Um, the, the interesting thing is, is uh, so at Toyota, to give you an example, they have roughly coming up to 300,000 staff, okay, internationally. How many ideas across their international organization do you think they have submitted on an annual basis? Any ideas? Just shout it out. Any? A thousand? A few thousands, did you say? So thousands? Any idea? Okay. Well, so it's actually a million. On average, they've averaged a million ideas every year, which I point out is close to, you know, between two and three per employee on average. What percentage of those ideas do you think are actually implemented? Pardon? Less than 10%. Less than 10%. Um, yeah, they actually implement uh, over 90% of their, the ideas submitted to their system on an annual basis. And they, most of those ideas are implemented um, essentially before they're submitted. <laughs> um, they encourage individuals to think, uh, to act rather than think, which mean, and the individuals are empowered to do so. So, for example, if you're on the station and you've just started work on a new station, so you've never used this station before, and you realize that each time you have to reach up to get a particular tool, you're stretching a little bit, okay? So they mention in there that you can stop the line, okay? So what you could then do is stop the entire line, okay? You pull the and on coordinates, you saw somebody reaching up and pulling the line. You stop the line, and you would then be able to adjust your tool so you're not stretching, um, which is both an improvement to your uh, kind of health, but also an improvement to your effectiveness in that particular station. Um, and start the line again. Um, chances are, if you only had to stop the line for a few minutes, no one's even going to, they, they won't even care, there wouldn't even be a, a, you know, there'd be an alarm, but it's not a, a notable thing. Um, if it was stopped for any significant length of time, then people will gather around, because obviously people can't uh, work at that point. A lot of people are unable to work, so they wander over and they say, what's going on? Is there, is there a problem? Um, but a lot of the time, those ideas and implement, those things are actually implemented literally before they even get into the system, but they're encouraged to report them, so that means they have that idea. This is something they've been running, their suggestion box system, something they've been doing since, I think, the 70s, um, with a very similar, uh, you know, a similar amount of ideas being submitted over that time. It's really important to demonstrate respect for the people that are your frontline staff, the people that are actually doing the work. 
in the case of a product organization, especially if we're building software, that's our engineers. In some respects, it's even crazier not to respect the frontline staff in a software organization because it's not that uncommon in many software organizations for the team that you are, let's say, leading as a product owner or a team lead to be earning more than you <laughs> in order for them to stay in the organization. And yet, you might not trust them to make a decision. An interesting story came up from a, a client I was working with on this, uh, oh, would have been about four years ago now, I think. And um, they had uh, invited me in to do some work on helping improve the autonomy of their teams. So they wanted their teams to be able to make more decisions on their own and be less dependent on their product owners and other people so they could just work more autonomously. Um, because that's part of the agile promise and they weren't getting it. <laughs> um, so I uh, was speaking to, their, uh, to one of the managers and he explained the things. I just said, could you give me an example of how much one of those decisions might actually cost or potentially make your organization? And this company was building uh, medical software. I mean, this software, a decision could be valued in millions and millions. You know, this was uh, obviously not all of them, but some of them significant. And I then said, do you have a dress code? <laughs> Which threw him, uh, because that question was a little out of context. But I knew he did from uh, other conversations I'd had. And he kind of humored me and just said, yeah, you know, just to keep everyone professional. And I just said, oh, that's interesting. So you want your teams to make decisions valued in the millions, but you don't trust them to get dressed in the morning. And I think that we actually often do those kinds of things because it seems to make sense, but maybe when you lay it out a little like that, it makes less sense. So another key thing is this idea called building consensus or nemawashi. Um, what we'll do is I'm going to skip to the next slide. There we go. So here is a, a production line. This is an example of excellent keynote animation. And this dude, we'll call him Steve, has just noticed there is a problem. The wonderful, perfect boxes now have a small chip on the side for some reason or another. He doesn't know why, but when he noticed the problem, he pulled the line and called, pulled the handle cord, and now the line has stopped. At this point, his manager glides over. Uh, you know those shoes the kids wear, wheelies? That's what they all wear in this factory. I don't know if that's standard, uh, but it's what Keynote allowed me to do. So he slides over and just says, what's the problem? What's going on? Uh, he says, well, look, there's, a, there's an issue with the quality. Said, OK, it's good that you noticed that. Um, and he said, well, you know, what do you think it could be the issue? Well, I wonder if it's the metal working station. They had problems yesterday. He said, well, actually, the manager says, I, I've been, just been there. I, I don't think it is the metal working station. They seem OK. Let's walk the line uh, and see what happens and see if we notice anything. So they glide over uh, to Paula. And Paula's there on the station. And they have a chat. And they say, look, we've just noticed that there's this issue. And Together, they notice that that machine seems to be damaging the, the blue boxes in some way as they pass through. And they then build a consensus on a few things. Well, let's say, what, what do you think? What's the, the quickest way for us to, to fix this problem? How do we know that this problem is fixed? And what are we going to, you know, let's, what, what's, the plan of, what's the plan of action? So they go ahead and they decide that they decide on a thing they're going to do. We're going to fix the metalworking component of this machine. We're going to do this to it. And obviously, how we can prove that it's fixed is there will no longer be dents in, the, in the, the boxes as they go down the line. And what they notice is that actually there's a problem with the specific way that that machine and that station was operating that might cause the machine to fail in that way. So what they do is they update a thing they call the standardized work in order to change the recipe, so to speak, for how they operate the station, how they build blue boxes and process them. And they do that collectively as that group. They form a consensus around the best way to do the work they're doing. So it's an interesting thing is that Toyota have a thing called standardized work. You know what, Taylor had a thing called standardized work. Here's one true way. But what's interesting is that Toyota defines standardized work as standardized tasks and processes 
are the foundation for continuous improvement and employee empowerment. Because standardized work at Toyota is a record of how the teams are working and not a diktat of how they should be. There's a really interesting thing here as well, is that when the leader and the manager on a team works with their individual, so when they come over and they say, what seems to be the problem? Oh, well, you, know, you stop the line, what seems to be the problem? There's this inherent contract between management and team leadership, which is that as a manager, they respect that that individual has close-up knowledge and a dedication to solve the problem because they know what it's there, because they're right there. But also, the team member respects the big picture perspective that that brings them, which allows them to ask those questions that guide them to a solution. And because both of them want to get to a solution, they respect those different perspectives. So, amazingly, and I think the things that we can learn when we look at organizations like Toyota, is that we actually have to solve the problems collaboratively. And that means that that doesn't mean just the team solving the problems on their own, and it doesn't mean the product owner solving all the problems, bringing the team the solution and the team going to the pub. It actually means getting together and solving them. And you know what? If we bring UX into that equation as well, you have the customer, the product owner, and the team collaboratively solving the problems for them. And when you look at the organizations that are delivering the best experiences for their users today, the users are actively involved. If you look at the user communities of some pieces of software, for example, are really good examples of that. So that's right. We need to collaborate. <laughs> Collaboration is important, as was said by Vanilla Ice a long time ago. <laughs> so how do we bring this together? Start by bringing a hypothesis to your team, an idea, a thought, that if you need to do this thing, then maybe, possibly, this outcome might happen. You don't have certainty, you just have a hypothesis. You have a thought, you have a gut feeling, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with bringing a gut feeling, but be open about the fact that it's a gut feeling. <laughs> You're not bringing a solution. And you ask the team, to invalidate your hypothesis. Give me an experiment that proves that I'm wrong. Why do we say prove that I'm wrong? Because we have a thing called confirmation bias, which strongly affects our ability. If you ask a team, especially if you're all good friends, maybe if they hate you as a product owner, then they'll do this anyway. Uh, but assuming that you're all pals and it's all going very well, uh, then there's a very, very good chance that they will prove your theory to be correct, uh, because they want it to be. <laughs> if you ask them to invalidate your hypothesis. And specifically, you say, what is the cheapest, quickest way to invalidate my hypothesis? The team then go away and they attempt to invalidate your hypothesis. They might fail to invalidate it, or they might not. But either way, they're going to get some learning from that, and they're going to learn the direction to go in. Knowing what doesn't work is almost even more important than knowing what does. There's far more things that don't work than things that do, in most cases. And as you learn more, you begin to build, um, you build obviously more hypotheses, and that cycle continues. And what's interesting is, as a team, on day one of your new product or project, you know very little collectively about the thing that you're doing. But if you follow this cycle over time, each cycle of learning, experimentation, and delivery, you learn more and more, which means collectively, as an entire team, you build consensus around the product, consensus knowledge around the product that you're delivering. In fact, everyone on the team becomes a little bit product owner. Everyone knows about the product. So, let's pull this back together. These are the five pillars, as I see them. <laughs> respect people. Don't bring your team solutions to implement. Show the team that you actually respect their ability to solve problems and bring them problems to solve, because that's what they do, and that's what you pay them for. 
nothing more frustrating than being solutionized to. <laughs> Uncertainty. We spend a lot of time pretending that we have the solutions for everything. Uncertainty is a really difficult and uncomfortable feeling. We don't like it. In fact, human beings, I think, hate uncertainty more than almost anything else. But the reality is it's still there. We can pretend it's not. But I can tell you right now, having your Gantt chart laid out for the next two years of planning and delivery makes it absolutely no more likely that you will deliver in two years. It just makes you feel a little better. I suppose if you print it off and wrap it round yourself, you can pretend it's a duvet. Uh, but it doesn't even make a very good duvet. When you're faced with uncertainty, and you actually say, look, there's uncertainty, as opposed to, ah, quick, I, no, there's no uncertainty, I have a Gantt chart. What you can do is you can actually tackle them head on and say, let's have some experiments. Let's use experimentation to tackle this, because that's actually how we deal with it. The only way that you can deal with uncertainty is to, to dip your foot in the water a little bit and see if it's OK. It's a nice line, which is crossing the water by feeling the stones. And that's what you do. If you're faced across a stream or a piece of water, you dip your foot in, you see if there's a stone in there. Oh, yeah, I can just about, OK, that's fine. Oh, that's a bit cold, that bit. All right, well, all right, we're going to do that way. You don't just dive in. And that's what small experiments are. It's saying, we know we want to kind of get over there somewhere, but we've got to get across this stream. And then continuous learning. With every experiment comes learning. Every time you do something, every time you validate or invalidate your hypotheses, you're learning something about the product that you're delivering, about your users. And what's really important is that you, you're always moving towards the goal. <laughs> you, you know, if you are trying to cross that river, and you have three or four stones in front of you, and you push that one and it kind of wobbles and falls away, well, you still, you might not have moved forwards, but you know what, you've knocked down three, one possible path, and you know that was a dangerous one. And in fact, what often happens in organizations is that they look at the, the thing, they plan their Gantt chart path across the river, but because they weren't there doing an experiment, they're far more likely to step full weight on that rock that sends them flying into the deep bit of the river and gets them wet and cold. Far more likely than someone that takes each little step carefully, feels the ground, and takes a small step forwards. Organizations frequently, frequently use planning and upfront planning as a way to try and combat risk. But that isn't the way to combat risk and uncertainty. It's the way to ignore it. And then finally, no complacency. Allow the consensus to build up naturally, but ensure that it is safe to question everything, even the things that seem certain, especially the things that seem so certain, because they're the things that are going to get you. I think it was misquoted to Mark Twain. You know, it ain't the things that you're sure of, or it ain't the things that uh, you don't know that get you, it's the things that you know for sure. I, I think that's very, very true in many organizations. So, to bring them together, respect people, embrace uncertainty, use small experiments to tackle uncertainty, make sure those experiments lead to continuous learning, and question everything, never get complacent. So I gave you all some horrible stickers at the beginning. Um, could I ask the product owners to stand up again for me, please? I'll be nice to you this time, I promise. So there's another side effect to what happens when you are collaborating truly, when you actually have a team of product owners all working together, is that, well, could you now remove your labels? <laughs> you can leave them on if you want. You can hide them, maybe. Welcome to the team. <laughs> Thank you very much.